This is episode four of Short Stories, 200 Years of the Royal Academy of Music, presented by Anna Picard. In this episode, we'll hear about the life of Harriet Cohen, one of a clutch of extraordinary pianists to emerge from the Academy under the tuition of Tobias Maté. When Harriet died in 1967, she bequeathed a large collection of paintings, some photographs and her gold bracelet to the Academy, with a request that the room in which the paintings were to be housed be named the Arnold Bax Room. Amid the portraits and busts of famous men of the 19th and 20th centuries in the Royal Academy of Music, one woman stands out. Her image is everywhere, in photographs and portraits from the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s. She is strikingly beautiful. Her dark hair is parted in the middle and drawn into a knot at the back of her long white neck. Her expression, sometimes smiling as though at a private joke, sometimes unnervingly direct sometimes profoundly sad. Helen Fry is her biographer. Harriet Cohen today is probably not a name that anyone will recognise, but in fact, in the early part of the 20th century, particularly in the 1920s and 1930s, she was a household name, not just in the United Kingdom, but internationally. Harriet was a pianist who championed the music of Bach, composing her own arrangements of his chorale preludes. She programmed works by Tudor and contemporary composers. She premiered pieces by Bartok, Defire and Sibelius, and brought new music from the Soviet Union to the West. And she had an extraordinary ability to captivate her audience. In conversation with the American pianist David Dubal, the writer and cultural commentator Quentin Crisp recalled seeing Harriet perform. She was the great performer. Crisp describes how Harriet would manage her arrival on stage to maximum effect. She would wait till the audience was just about to become restless, but hadn't yet become annoyed. <laughs> then she would appear on stage, but never fast. Then there was a pause in which she bowed, I think, first to the conductor. Mm -hmm. And she gave him a grave look, as though music were a friend that both of them had known who was now dead. There was another bow to the audience before Harriet sat at the piano, an artful arrangement of her dress and the ritual removal of jewellery from her fingers and wrists until, finally, she was ready to play the first note. And by this time it didn't matter what note she played because the audience was already totally given over <laughs> to the wish that she would a star. Harriet Cohen's reputation dwindled in the decades after World War II but a recent release of remastered historical recordings means we can hear her play and imagine ourselves into her dazzling company. You know what Bernard Shaw said? What? There's only one Harriet. Referring uh, to? Me. <laughs> did he? <laughs> yes, he did. I think that's a very great Has honor. he been to Gloucester House Muse? Gloucester Place Muse. Gloucester oh, Place yes. Muse. We were very intimate friends since I was about 17. And... Um, I mean, sometimes he could be a little bit, what's the word, um, sharp on you. He could be quite critical. But I think he was very fond of me, if I may say so. And even though I lost most of my possessions by bombing, I still got about 65 letters from him. Famous as she was in the music world, she also had a bit of a bohemian social life and would mix with intellectuals, again, household names, 
H.G. Wells, George Bernard Shaw were amongst her closest friends, Albert Einstein. She seems to have mixed with some of the most famous literary and cultural figures of the 20th century. Harriet left thousands of letters after her death in 1967, many of them chronicling her friendships and love affairs with famous men. But she also had strong friendships with women. She had a close friendship with Rebecca West. Rebecca West fictionalised her in the novel Harriet Hume, also with a journalist, American journalist Dorothy Thompson, and the two women together, Harriet and Dorothy, were really fearsome, actually, particularly in the 1930s, because they both had the ear of politicians. Harriet had very close friendship, I mean, really intimate friendship with Ramsay MacDonald, the then Prime Minister. She is petitioning into his ear about the situation of Jewish refugees in Europe, as is Dorothy Thompson back in America. So they are raising the profile of the Jewish refugee crisis in Europe and what Adolf Hitler is doing. The photographs and portraits we have of Harriet, and there are at least 80 in the National Portrait Gallery, are so fabulous and sexy, and her lifestyle so bracingly racy, that that is sometimes where people stop looking. Well, I've noticed that whenever people talk about Harriet Cohen, they get very sidelined by her relationships, which is a sort of classic way of looking at a high-achieving female artist, really. You start talking about who they've had um, intimate relationships with, which I think is not only boring, but it's actually very reductive of someone who is clearly creative and lyrical and uh, luminous. Joanna McGregor is a concert pianist, curator, conductor and head of piano at the Royal Academy of Music. Anybody who, who's talking about a male or female, they unconsciously or not, they do the male gaze thing and they go, oh, she was very glamorous, she was very beautiful, very aware of image, she had a lot of relationships. And then they overlook actually the playing, the commissioning, the long career, um, the political stuff she achieved during the 30s and 40s and her political friends. Um, so for me, it's just, you know, they treat her like Marilyn Monroe or something, which is very disappointing. Let's talk about what character comes through in the play. What do you hear when you listen to Harriet? Well, like many pianists of the time, she has got a real luminosity in the touch and the playing. I think we have to remind ourselves that they were playing on different pianos, you know, different types of pianos. They had bell-like resonances. They weren't what we're used to now, which is this American-style Steinway, which is designed to hit the back of a 3,000-seat venue. The pianos of those times were, even if they were a Steinway, they were bell-like gentle instruments that could deliver a lyricism, and that's very often coupled with the type of recording that they're making, coupled with the way people did sing at the piano, I think that's what you're hearing, actually. You're hearing sound of the time. like me it's a golden age of pianism the 30s and 40s I mean we all I think that was the greatest period of, of playing the piano because people had a creativity and they, they they approached music in a very individual way and it's just you know the 40s and 30s are full of these fantastic pianists who had something to say and said it very individually and many of these pianists were taught at the Royal Academy and beyond by the same man, 
Tobias Mate. Stephen Seek's piano teacher, Denise La Simone, was herself taught by Mate, so this makes Stephen a kind of grand pupil. He's also Tobias Mate's biographer. In my view, Tobias Mate was the greatest of all piano teachers. It is a view that I hasten to add is not shared by everyone. Perhaps not, but Tobias Mate's extraordinary and wide-ranging influence through his teaching and through the success of his students is something that Jonathan Freeman Atwood, principal of the Royal Academy of Music, is keen to make sure that people remember. I think partly because I have this idea in my head that they haven't been celebrated enough, either individually or as a group. I think traditions of pedagogy can often get lost somehow they become part of the furniture and you forget to see what the fruits of their labours really were. You look at the generation of Harriet Cohen, Mara Hess, uh, Irena Shara, Eileen Joyce, uh, latterly Maura Limpini, and you have five absolutely extraordinary artists whose music-making is very distinctive. When we go back and we listen to the recordings, and there are some fantastic recordings, remasterings of these great players, you suddenly realise that there was something extraordinary going on. They made such an incredible mark on British and international musical life. Harriet Cohen was one of the first really distinguished soloists in in Henry Wood's new promenade concerts. Shara was less obviously a superstar. She was quite withdrawn in certain ways, but her playing had such refinement and such extraordinary finesse, as you can hear in those recordings. And, of course, Mara Hess became De Mara Hess, a kind of legend in the Second World War, because she was, of course, the one who played those really important concerts in the National Gallery at the time of the Blitz and, and in the war. I think, um, I'm not a pianist, but I think Mathé's pedagogy is based on a kind of sense of, of touch, a lyricism, but also a control and something that allows personality to be very quixotic and also quick-footed, if you see what I mean. There's a means by which in the little Mozart and Dante from G major sonata Shara enters a whole range of different worlds in three minutes. And that takes a sort of artistic identity and a confidence, but also a technical um, a control and something that allows you to feel to be an open vessel. Tobias Mate began teaching at the Royal Academy of Music in 1876, later establishing his own piano school in London, which ran for 30 years. His influence was global. My teacher, Denise Lassimone, who was his ward, sort of an adopted daughter, told me that by the early 1920s, uh, they always called him Uncle Tobbs. He, all, all of his pupils called him Uncle Tobbs. She said all Uncle Tobbs had to do was pick up the telephone and you had a concert engagement. Not even the major concert managers necessarily had that degree of influence. But it was immense. And it was widely admitted, it was widely conceded that when you came to London, perhaps you came from another part of England or you came from another country. You were expecting to study piano. Uh, You could not make a career unless you had spent a little time at Maté's piano school. Whether that was right or wrong, many people believed it. The influence in America took a little bit longer, but I will tell you this, that by the 1930s, nearly every conservatory, Yale, Juilliard, wanted to have a Matte pupil on the faculty. 
My name is Alison Devonish. I am a Royal Academy of Music alumna. I am a coach, collaborative pianist, music director, arranger, sometime composer, and a little bit of violin. Okay, Tobias Mate, and mm. you're a great grandchild of that I, piano school? I am. I am a great grandchild from two sides, from Canada and from here. In Canada, my teacher uh, that I had before I came to England was a man named Dale Bartlett, who was taught by Vivian Langrish, who was taught by Tobias Mathe. And here at the Academy, I was taught by Ruth Hart, who was also taught by Vivian Langrish, who was taught by Tobias Mathe. What would you describe as the identifying sort of properties of the, the Mathe sound or the Mathe technique? The pursuit of a beautiful sound and to achieve that through acknowledging the weight of the hand and the wrist and the forearm and the upper arm and how the application and understanding of weight onto the key can deliver a beautiful sound. When I play, that is always what I'm aiming for, regardless of the, the style, the composer, the tempo. It's to make a beautiful sound. The compelling thing about Mate is that nearly everything he believed about piano playing, he wrote down. There's scarcely any other major pianist or piano teacher who has ever done that. Mate had ideas for his time period that were immensely unusual. He used terms like weight, arm weight, and relaxation. And others were beginning to use them in Germany and elsewhere about that time, but uh, they sometimes went off the deep end and didn't really pay much attention to the fingers. But Mate knew it all, and he put them together in what are now known as the Mate principles. I mean, everything that Mate says in his writings are things that you, we all say now, all the time to people, and uh, try to coax out a lyricism and a, and a sense of singing at the piano, because the piano is effectively a percussion instrument, and Mate was very good about explaining the innards of a piano and the, how the hammers hit the strings, and then saying, basically, you've got to work against that and you have to produce a cantable. Of course, you know, that's absolutely what everybody wants to do. Could we explore this idea of a beautiful sound? What exactly do you mean by beautiful? Uh, a sound that sings, that rings that can mimic a voice, that can mimic a string instrument. The percussive nature of a piano and the very fact that a sound decays the minute you play is the problem I think that we all are always trying to overcome to create a line that can just last forever. and. Sometimes it's our imagination, and sometimes it's what we are physically able to do, and the combination of the two. Of Tobias Mate's leading pupils, the name with the most resonance today is Myra Hess, who we can hear now and whose concert series at the National Gallery during the Blitz was rewarded with a damehood. Myra was a few years older than Harriet. The two women had a difficult relationship. And i telling tales out of school here a little bit, but Denise told me this, who knew both women, Myra and Harriet, very well. She tried many times to talk Myra out of being so combative and being so negative toward Harriet, to no avail. But she knew it wouldn't do any good to say the same thing to Harriet because Harriet, uh, well, for better or worse, she liked to hold grudges. And she really blamed Myra for so many of the failures she had. She wrote to Matte in the early 1930s 
sounds like a modern expression, but she said, Myra is always running her down. And it was a particularly hampering Harriet's chances in America. Myra, of course, was a goddess in America. Americans loved her. And so Myra was in a little bit of a position there, probably to exert a bit of influence, and she didn't hesitate. Uh, Denise also told me that Myra's idea of an intellectual challenge, and she got pretty good at it, was doing the Times crossword puzzle. Uh, Harriet could read Immanuel Kant in German. She really wasn't intellectual. There's no question of that, a marvelous intellectual. I mean, these are very, very different women. And in a way, perhaps Myra Hess is less the threat in the male world than Harriet Cohen. And you just can't imagine Harriet sitting still long enough to finish a crossword. <laughs> Why do you think that she has slightly sort of faded from view. There have been some recent historical recordings have been cleaned up and, and re-released, but I mean, the first I became aware of her was wandering around the Academy and seeing all these extraordinary images of her. It's a mystery in many ways. I don't know if there's a single answer. There is a, a thinking that because she had a nearly 40-year love affair with Sir Arnold Bax, who became Marsh the King's music, she couldn't be publicly really recognised. There's a lot of um, anxiety, I think, amongst some scholars of the Bax camp about Harriet and her influence on him. Lewis Foreman has done wonderful work to write these marvelous biographies of Bax, and he has a passage in one of them I remember distinctly. He opens a chapter where he's going to talk about Harriet, and he said, um, I wonder if there will ever come a time where we'll be able to evaluate Harriet Cohen's piano playing objectively because it is so clouded, I'm paraphrasing, but it is so clouded by her relationship with Bax. Stephen Seek traces the roots of Myra and Harriet's discord to the behaviour of Bax. This starts, I'm going to say, about the time Harriet is 19. And that's when she and Bax begin their rather surreptitious affair. Bax, of course, is still married. In fact, he remains married almost for the entire time they're together. Bax wants Myra to play his pieces because she's very well known in London and he wants his music to be heard. He would like to write things for Harriet. And sometimes he even does this in one piece that he writes for her. He has a nickname for her. They both went to Russia on the sly once, and they gave each other Russian names. Uh, she called him Arnoltska, and he always called her Tanya. And so he wrote at the top of his piece, it's called To a Maiden with a Daffodil. She went to a party at Frederick Quarter's house, and she wore a dress that had a daffodil on it. And then he sent her all these daffodil bouquets. And that was kind of a turning point in their relationship. So he dedicated the piece to Tanya. And that's what's on the um, manuscript. But he wanted Myra to play it. So when it, when it was published, he changed the dedication to Myra Hess. He does do things like this quite often. He's playing the two women against each other, rather mercilessly, perhaps. But when Myra finds out about it, of course, she's not amused. Arnold Bax really doesn't come out of this story very well. Harriet clearly wanted to marry him, but Bax's wife, Elsa, wouldn't divorce him. And when Elsa died in 1947, Bax didn't tell Harriet. 1948, the will is published in, I think it's the Times newspaper, and she sees this and she confronts him and says, oh my goodness, you know, now we can get married. And he says, no, I'm not going to marry you because I've got another woman. And the impact is totally, totally devastating. He's had another lover, mistress, uh, Mary Gleaves, for 20 years. Just two or three weeks later, she falls with a tray of glasses. And this is portrayed in all the national newspapers as the accident. She ends up in hospital with about 18 stitches all up her arm. Now, it's always been reported an accident, but during my research, it became quite clear that this was no accident. I interviewed pathologists who said, if you fall with a tray of glasses, there's no way you can do the damage that she'd have done to her wrist. Harriet's concert career never recovered. While her legacy as a performer faded from view until recently, 
Her influence in terms of musical taste and choice of repertoire can still be heard in the Academy today. My name is Rebecca Leung. I'm a student at the Royal Academy of Music in my final year of piano performance undergraduate. I've been at the Royal Academy since I was nine years old, so yeah, this place is like my home. I'm a great admirer of Harriet Cohen's Bach recordings. I think they're probably among my favourite Bach interpretations. And you're the winner of this year's Harriet Cohen Bach Prize. Yes, that's, that's right. For me, this Prelude and Fugue is probably one of my favourites to perform. I just love the simplicity of the Prelude. I think at the core of Bach's music, there's a simplicity that, especially during the pandemic, it was something that I really needed. I've always loved Bach's music, but it was something, yeah, just during the lockdown and everything that it just drew me in further. There's a sort of logic to it, isn't there? There's a calm. That yeah, you're, you're there, not get there lost. is. There's always a sense of direction, you know, he's like, I don't know, taking care of you as a pianist, yeah. to ask you a, probably a very silly question. Harriet herself in her memoirs and in her book Music's Handmade makes much mention of her small hands. Now I'm looking at you, you're very petite. You have quite small hands. Um, has it held you back? When I was younger I always was like oh I want, I want big hands. I, I mean I can't play a ninth properly so I, I can play octaves which is you know what you need but um no, I don't think it's ever held me back in terms of choosing repertoire because you can get away with very much I think in a way it's made me more determined to succeed as I'm a lot smaller than some of my colleagues and I'm like well I can play the same as you can so sort of thing yeah there's much made of Harriet's, not least by herself, of the smallness of her hands. How much of an issue would that be for any pianist? I don't know. Not really. Not much. Baron boim has got very small hands. Ashkenazi has got very small hands. You've only got to listen to the opening chords of Rack 2 of any recording and you know instantly how big people's hands are because you hear how they've got to spread the chords. And um, you'd be surprised at the number of men who've got quite small hands. You just have to be a bit more flexible in the wrist and the forearms. I think she exaggerated perhaps to get herself off the hook a little bit because Harriet never really wanted to play much from the 19th century. But that's what got the engagements. Uh, you had to play romantic music. Uh, you know, if you play Chopin, if you play Schumann, you play Brahms, you know, those are the composers everyone wants to hear. And if you play Bach, well... Yeah, maybe, but not quite so much. And she played a lot of modern music. Mm -hmm. 
She knew Dmitry Kabalevsky when he was a young composer in the Soviet Union starting out, and she thought a lot of him, and she made one of the earliest recordings of his Sonatina, which is a charming piece. It's a fabulous recording. It's an unbelievable recording. It doesn't really take big hands, though, and it doesn't sound very, it doesn't sound very romantic, I would say, but oh, my word, what she could do with that stuff. I know she often said that, that her hands were too small for the big romantic pieces, but I think that was as much an issue of taste and were her, where she wanted to go with her own music. It is easy to think of Harriet Cohen as a victim of Arnold Bax's duplicity and of the male musical establishment that celebrated her beauty but undermined her artistry. But this is to ignore the tremendous success with which Harriet was able to move through society at home and abroad, staying true to her own political and musical interests, influencing those in power to help the helpless, favouring the very old and the very new over traditional concert repertoire. She was never quite satisfied with the solitude and rigour required of the model concert pianist. She was too thirsty for new ideas, new experiences, new people, and too fascinated by philosophy, polyphony and art. Though she never became Lady Bax, outliving her unconstant lover by 14 years, Harriet made sure that, posthumously, she and Bax would always be together. I mean, it's interesting to reflect that even at the end of Harriet's life, she's bequeathed these incredible paintings by famous artists, this incredible collection to the Royal Academy of Music, on condition that it's housed in the Bax room. And she cemented that relationship. She's almost eclipsed anything of his relationship to Mary Gleaves, she's ultimately had the, the last glory, hasn't she, in being able to very publicly link the two of them together. was episode four of short stories 200 years of the royal academy of music thank you for listening it was presented by anna pickard and was produced by natalie steed the historical recordings were provided by apr and a list of all the music played can be found in the episode description to hear more short stories subscribe to the podcast or search for podcasts at the royal academy of music website